Hi, I'm Gina Wesley, and I manage the standardized patient program for the College of Medicine here at the University of Kentucky. I just took this role on back in April after 24 years of doing standardized patient programs across the country from the University of Louisville, so hi to all my U of L friends, uh, to Texas A&M, LSU, University of Cincinnati. And finally, I'm back home here in Lexington. You see, I was born just down the street at Good Samaritan Hospital. So when I say I bleed blue, I bleed blue, y'all. And proud of it. So coming back to UK, where I did my master's and doctorate work way back in the late 90s, um, uh, has truly felt like a homecoming for me. So getting the opportunity to be here with you today is especially uh, touching and heartwarming, and I appreciate your time. Yes? Closer to the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for telling me. All right. So... Speaking of grad studies, when I was in graduate school here at UK, I was studying health communication, um, which I have a great passion for. And there was an outbreak of Ebola in Gambon, and I wanted to go. I wanted to go so bad because I was 22 years old and, and I knew I could fix all the communication issues that were going on uh, in the World Health Organization's response. Well, funny thing, they didn't invite me, uh, so I didn't get to make it there. But what did happen for me is I discovered a real deep love and passion for infectious diseases and how they affect populations, how they affect culture, how they affect governs, governance. So um, that was something I started studying back in the late 90s as I was going through graduate school. Fast forward a few years to 2000. I was hired to direct the brand spanking new uh, UofL standardized patient program and uh, was really enjoying that process. I'll tell you a little bit more about standardized patients in a moment. And um, I got a call from the brand spanking new Dean of Public Health, Dr. Rick Clover. Anybody remember Dr. Clover? Uh, Dr. Clover was the new Dean for Public Health and he had seen my work with standardized patients and I was doing something called moulage. And you're going to see some moulage in a little bit. Not all of it is easy to look at. So there's your first warning. Uh, he wanted to know what kinds of moulage I could do. Now, moulage is when we simulate injuries, illness, et cetera, using makeup on a human. And I said, well, so far we're doing like ligature marks for elder abuse. We're doing uh, domestic violence. We're using moulage for a lot of things. Think about what was going on in uh, 2001. Not only did we have 9-11, but preceding 9-11 by about 10 months, we had anthrax letters being sent across the country. Rick wanted to know, can you simulate a cutaneous anthrax lesion? And all my antennae went up. And I was like, I know I can do it. I've never tried, but I know I can do this for you. And that was the beginning of it all for me. Um, the relationships I formed coming out of that one simple phone call added up to several million dollars in grants and contract funding from everyone from the CDC to HRSA to Homeland Security, Kentucky Homeland Security, Kentucky Department for Public Health, and the list goes on and on. It further grew out of an interest in bioterrorism uh, into doing simulations for things like oral pharyngeal cancers. And how do we train physicians, nurses, anyone performing oral pharyngeal examinations to recognize early on the symptoms of, say, a melanoma in the mouth or the throat? 
So we were able to bring in millions and millions of dollars to the University of Louisville. Uh, plus, we had a number of, of national peer-reviewed publications and quite a few international, national, and regional conference presentations. So what are standardized patients, which is what we use in the College of Medicine here, or as I'm going to refer to them during the presentation, simulated patients? These are people that I hire to come in and work with our health professions students. Um, and I train them very extensively to know their case history, to know um, uh, all of their symptoms, their family medical history, their own past medical history, et cetera. So they're prepared for almost any question a student or faculty member is going to toss at them. Then I standardize them because we want to make sure that if a student gets into room eight uh, for a case of botulinum toxin, that they're going to see the same patient, the same patient as if they get in room six, assigned to room six with a patient. Does this start to make sense? So we give the students an opportunity in a safe environment where they can't hurt anyone to practice on my patients. Uh, what they practice is, first of all, they learn their history-taking skills, and they also learn physical exam skills. Now, you can imagine I spend a lot of time on both of these topics, and just when I think I've got them down in one area, another one pops its head up, and, and we have to go after that one, too. Um, However, it's a wonderful process to watch our students start as first-year students and, and move through their graduate studies. It's very, very satisfying. We use standardized patients here at UK throughout all four years of the medical curriculum. We also use them in pharmacy. We use them for the PA studies program. Um, Looking forward to doing some work with the College of Public Health. And uh, we have a budding relationship now with the College of Law. Because what we do is not constrained by medicine. We can do things outside of medicine and simulate situations. The College of Law is super excited to have people that we can train and have their students practice working with them. Um, so we're looking forward to doing that. So how does this apply to you? Primarily, the discussions that I've had with, with John Lyons, Dr. John Lyons, have focused on training for public health workers, public health administration, community health workers, the full gamut. How do we not only help them practice, because this is the really beautiful part of simulated patients. They not only are trained to let our students, our faculty, our practitioners practice on them, but they're also trained to assess them. And so it is not uncommon in my little 14 exam room clinic uh, up on South Limestone to watch uh, on camera as a student works with a patient who is suffering a pneumothorax. So they have a collapsed lung and nobody knows why, but they're really struggling to breathe and it's urgent we take care of this now. Let me tell you, I know it's kind of funny to hear, but I've made deans sweat. <laughs> I've made deans look for chest tubes for my patients. Um, so it's, it's very, very realistic, and you're going to see just a little bit of that in just a moment. Um, but after they let the student practice their history taking, their physical exam, their patient education, then when time is up, they sit up off that exam table and they say, okay, how did that feel to you? How did that go? What do you wish you could do differently? Well, let me give you some feedback too. And they go through what we've trained them to give as feedback to students. And that's an enormously powerful educational tool. And it's a remarkable thing to get to witness every day. Um, and what we have quickly discovered is that as we're working with adult learners, we have to treat them like adults. So adult learners have a whole list of things. They're listed. Can we go to, oh, I have to click. Begging your pardon. 
Oh, here are all the grands. My apologies. So here we are. I caught up. Okay, so they have, uh, adult learners have a whole list of needs. Primarily, they need to be involved in their education. They need to help set goals. They need to put hands on. They need to be able to apply what they're learning to actual situations. So it has to be relevant to them or it doesn't work. And our simulated patients bring everything on this list, everything an adult learner needs to the forefront in our uh, approach to medical, nursing, public health education. Okay. Is that once someone, whether they're a medical student or they are a public health administrator in the field, has the opportunity to interact with standardized patients and undergo training with these patients is they remember more information about that training for longer periods of time than if I stand up here and I show you a bunch of photographs. It just is the truth. They learn it better. They remember it longer. We can assess their decision-making or diagnostic process. We can provide immediate feedback, and we all know how critical that is. Um, and the learners themselves really enjoy working with these patients. They're special people. Um, I hope you get the chance to meet some of the patients at some point. They're really interesting. Um, so some critical elements for making this work. First of all, I would need to work with you. I would need your subject matter expertise because as much as I love medicine and nursing and public health and law and all these things, I can't be an SME in all of these areas. So I rely on the content experts to help me design the curriculum that you need for your learners, right? So we put together cases, we design assessment instruments together. Second thing we need are the extraordinarily well-trained patients who are far more than actors. They are educators. And they're, the, I would say, probably 10% of the effort of training them goes into portraying affect and symptoms and the emotional side of a case. The other 90% is about education and how you make this most effective for the learner in the room. Moulage expertise, if you're doing bioterrorism, is super, super important. It doesn't have to be bioterrorism. This could be a chicken pox outbreak. This could be mumps. This could be any number of threats to public health. It could also be how to, how to teach your workers to give feedback to the people that report to them and do that effectively. You also have to have a passion for public health. And looking out at you, I don't have to question that at all. I can tell. So let me introduce you to Moulage. This was the first one I developed. This is cutaneous anthrax in three stages. The one farthest to the left on this screen, I'm sorry, your right, my left, on this screen is the first week stage. And at this stage, it looks like something I would put a little Benadryl cream on. It looks like contact dermatitis, no big deal. Uh, the cat rubbed up against me again, right? Stage two is where it goes for another week. You get a little um, uh, dark spot in the middle where there's some necrotic tissue. You have some swelling or induration around that necrotic tissue. And it just looks weird. So when we had the anthrax letter attacks and we had victims of those who had cutaneous anthrax, this second stage is where they went to the ER or they went to their doctors. And what do you think the doctors said to them? Do you remember? What did they think that was? Especially on the East Coast where most of the uh, letters were sent out. A spider bite. Something like that, right? So they gave them steroids. 
steroids don't impact anthrax. Anthrax laughs at steroids. Uh, and so a week or two later, you get that third stage where you've got a lot of eschar, you've got a lot of swelling and induration. It's not painful. It's not itchy. It's just weird. And so because these physicians and nurses on the eastern half of the country had never been in contact with cutaneous anthrax, which is, by the way, endemic to the western half of the country. It grows in the soil nat naturally. That's why they call it wool sorters disease. Uh, it's not uncommon to get anthrax lesions out west. But the eastern folks had never seen this. And so this was when they said, okay, now we want to culture this. Now we want to figure out, there's obviously an organism at work. What is the organism? So um, we did a lot of work with anthrax, just teaching first responders in particular to recognize what cutaneous anthrax looks like, uh, because they're obviously at the tip of the spear for seeing these things. Okay, that's just a photo of me out at the old uh, gaseous diffusion plant in Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, we brought along a couple of simulators and laid them out. We were working with the gaseous diffusion plant um, and also the U.S. Army 31st CST out of Louisville. So that was a very cold, wet, miserable uh, day in February, and the Army accidentally set on fire the field where my standardized patients were all hiding. <laughs> they used a smoke canister. They threw it out to get the fire department at the plant to respond. And they threw it into this, this field where everything was dry because it's February and it set the field on fire. <laughs> so we have to be quick on our feet <laughs> and adaptable. This one's not as easy to look at. This takes me back to my interest in Ebola. So this is Linda. She's an infection control nurse in Louisville, Kentucky. Wonderful person. Uh, we used the Ebola simulation a number of times. The ones I can tell you about uh, took place at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport for a big triennial exercise where they wanted a viral hemorrhagic fever on site for um, uh, a plane crash and response. And also, we trained Louisville homicide detectives. So when they walked in, what do you think they thought this was? Domestic violence, right? And so we got to talk to them a lot about PPE and the fact that if it looks like this, it doesn't mean it is this. You need to have a differential diagnosis in your pocket for these things, right? So you can protect yourselves, your family, and your community. That was a lot of fun. So the, um, you see she has subscleral hemorrhaging. So I got to call the guy in Hollywood who does all the contact lenses for horror films. So he did like Hellraiser and a big series of films like that. I've never seen those, but that was what he was known for at the time. And he was so cool because when I told him what I needed, uh, he, he didn't even blink an eye. His response was uh, arterial or venous blood. <laughs> and I thought, I can work with this guy. I can work with him. Okay. Here's a day where we, uh, the Ford Motor Company in Louisville, very generously uh, but mistakenly loaned us the use of their corporate jet out at Louisville International Airport, now Muhammad Ali Airport. And um, we had... First responders from Louisville and Jefferson County and all around the state coming in to practice boarding an aircraft full of people uh, where someone was sick on board and have to make the decisions, who do we take off first, the well people or the sick person? How are we going to get the sick person off if they're non-compliant? How do we calm the other passengers? And then if these other passengers have been exposed to something in flight, what do we do with them? Do we let them go home and possibly spread something like a wild strain of polio 
throughout the, the community. So those very kinds of, those types of really tough questions were things we were confronting our folks with in Louisville. This is a photo from the Dallas-Fort Worth triennial exercise back in 2005. They had this huge cylindrical uh, object that they could set on fire over and over again for their fire, their rescue trucks to come out and put it out. A lot of fun. And this is this is my patient, my simulated patient, Diana, lying on the ground with symptoms of a viral hemorrhagic fever. Now, the thing you need to know about Texas, if you've never lived there, I got to live in Dallas for four years while I was with Texas A&M. They have fire ants. And so as we were designing this exercise, you guys know about fire ants, obviously. They're not, they're not good. They're bad. <laughs> so as we were designing this exercise, someone casually mentioned, what about the fire ants? And I said, fire ants? Because the bulk of the moulage is glucose-based. So they said, don't worry, Gina, we'll spray the field. We're going to kill them all so you can lay as many people out there as you want. And, and I brought like 50 people to this exercise, right? All of them covered in fake blood and injuries. And uh, they didn't get them all. They didn't get them all. And all the ones they didn't get found Diana, who was a real trooper. And her reward was getting to fly by helicopter to Bumsey, Baylor University Med Center, uh, as part of the exercise. So there are perks to being a simulated patient. Well, this is another exercise we did about the same time. This was in Somerset, Kentucky in a school, school building, and they wanted a chemical release exercise. They called it Schoolhouse Rocked. <laughs> How they come up with these names, I don't know, but they like to be witty. So uh, these are just some of the patients. There were also gunshots, as you can see, Jackie lying on the floor there. What we learned from Jackie that day is that if moulage stays on too long and you're lying on the floor, you stick to the floor. So I was going around afterwards with water and I was like pouring water on the moulage to help them get up off the floor uh, at the end of the, the day. So lots of fun stories, but also a lot of hard work goes into these exercises. So this is the biggie. This, um, I guess I should show it to you. This is Jackie, you just saw her shot. Um, we, um, my team and I were working with Dr. David Rungi, who was at the time the medical director of U.S. Homeland Security. And we were sharing with him photos of all the things we were doing, and we told him we'd like to put together an exercise for you. Uh, what would you like to have tested? And he said, test the airlines, test the FAA, test TSA. And so, in what at the time was a classified exercise, uh, we bought three plane tickets, one for me, one for Jackie, and one for my best friend, Dr. Bill Smock in Louisville. Anybody know Bill? Oh, you want to know Bill. Bill's a cop doc. So he's an ER physician who's also a member of the Louisville SWAT team. And he makes entry with the SWAT team and is there not only as law enforcement, but also to take care of any officers that are injured. A pretty incredible person. So Bill came with us on this trip because I was certain we were all going to jail. <laughs> you see what I do for my job. You know I love this, right? We flew out of Louisville. She walked straight through TSA with these lesions on her face. Anybody want to guess what this is? Smallpox, day three. So if you're not familiar with smallpox, the first couple days of smallpox are brutal. Temp is 104, sometimes 105. You're flat on your back. You're non-ambulatory. But around day three, 
there's a 12 to 24 hour window where patients become ambulatory again. Their fever drops to around 101, 102, and they're able to get on airplanes, go to grocery stores, these kinds of things. By the way, when the Soviet bloc broke up, small some of the smallpox vials in Russia disappeared. We don't know where they are. We don't know who took them, but they're gone. They're unaccounted for. And that's why we made such a big deal about smallpox. Smallpox is also one of the top diseases that the CDC considers a bioterrorism threat. Um, so that's another reason why we did this. So we flew Jackie out of Louisville and into Cincinnati at CVG, where we spent a couple hours in the Delta Sky Room or whatever they call that. We had some drinks. We, you know, watched the airplanes. We snapped a photo of Jackie there. Then we boarded a flight for DCA, Reagan National, in Washington, D.C. Because my colleague Bill was wearing a firearm, you have to report those things, <laughs> and you have to show your badge, and you have to have forms that you can sign and all this to make it okay for you to carry a firearm onto an aircraft. You see why I was scared of jail, right? So Bill had gone through that process. When he identified himself as a deputy U.S. marshal, they said, for your information, there are two air marshals on this flight. So um, we will text them, we'll let them know that you're going to be there, and maybe you guys could say hello before the flight takes off. And that's what happened. Now, they didn't see Bill with me and Jackie, so they had no reason to associate her with him. They just said hello, shook hands, introduced themselves, and then everyone got on the plane. The U.S. Marshals sat in first class across the aisle from each other, so we walked right between them. They didn't say a word. They were so engrossed in their cell phones, they weren't paying attention. She walked right past them. So I had not only put these lesions on Jackie's face, I had also spritzed her with glycerin so she looked febrile, right? She looks like she's got a fever. She had a bit of a cough, and she would hold her back at times because terrible back pain is one of the big symptoms early on. We go back, we sit in the back of the plane again. No one said anything at any of the three airports. Not one word from ticket agents to TSA to the flight attendants to flipping U.S. Marshals, y'all. Because they don't know. And here's the scary part. They still don't know. They still aren't receiving this training. Now, I may be egocentric, but I think it's our job to make sure that they know these things. We have to be aggressive in going forward to let them know how critical it is that they look at people. Just as we tell doctors and nurses, look at your patient. We need to tell our first responders and our health health. Uh, public health workers, look at the patient, look at the passenger, look at the guy next to you in the base, at the baseball game this weekend. I worked up a little chicken pox as a differential diagnosis. And so as we were doing these trainings, I was taking these standardized patients with me all across the U.S., uh, to train people. And by that time, I was contracting with U.S. Homeland Security to deliver these trainings. And uh, so we taught them about differential diagnoses. How is this different? Is there a backup on this? Wow, that's okay. Let's just say, how does, okay, oh yeah, I got it. Good, thank you. Okay, so how does this look different from this, oh, sorry, now it's touchy. The big difference is smallpox presents as a synchronous crop. It all comes out in the same stage and it progresses in the same stage. It also starts in the mouth and moves to the peripheral body, right? You see that? 
all the same stage. They all look the same size. There are no scabs in there. It's all the same. On chickenpox, it's just the opposite. It starts on the stomach or the back, and it spreads outward. And you've got, it's an asynchronous crop, so you've got all kinds of stages of lesions growing there. This is very simple. Police and firefighters understand these things. We can teach them how to recognize these things. And using simulated patients to do it guarantees that they'll learn more and retain that information longer. So the next day, this gentleman flew in from Afghanistan where he was with the US Army and was taken directly to London Hospital uh, and uh, they thought he had smallpox because he reported to the hospital that he had already had chickenpox as a kid. And when they called his mom, she said, yes, he had chickenpox as a kid. So they put him on another helicopter <laughs> and they flew him to Louisville. And I had the privilege of getting to go in the room and meet this gentleman who was sick as a dog, y'all. Really big fever, muscle aches, miserable, itchy rash that started where? On his stomach and back. What do you notice about the lesions? All different stages. And so Bill and I literally high-fived and said, this is chicken pox. We don't know why he has chicken pox again, but he does. Um, and so he was fine. He was fine. He was really sick for a while, but he was fine. So, next up, another picture of fire ant, Diana. There she is. Okay, we used Diana for a test of TSA. Can you see her lesions? Probably not very well, right? Diana's a person of color. She doesn't show a lot of erythema or redness around the lesions, so it's easier to miss in this presentation. So we threw a couple bones to TSA to see if we could get her on a flight. We booked the flight in the name Edward Williams. Her name is Deanna Williams, right? So she shows up to TSA and Global Security, who's the first row, and then TSA is next. And they both waved her right through because I have to say she's a remarkably gorgeous woman. She's very confident. She's a model. She's very good at what she does. And she presented herself no nonsense in a no-nonsense way, and they waved her right through. One TSA agent said, it says here, Edward. And she said, yeah, that was my dad's name. It was my mom's little joke. Everybody calls me Eddie but her ID said Deanna. They let her go through. They had a good laugh about the name and they let her go through because they don't know. So here's my question to you. If you were sitting next to Deanna right now, what would you have said to her? Would you have talked to her? Ask her about a rash? If she's clearly febrile, she's not feeling well, would you have asked her anything? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. It's difficult, isn't it? Do we have an obligation to keep this person off an aircraft to save lives? We absolutely do. As healthcare providers, healthcare workers, we have that responsibility 24 seven. Am I right? So here's a, a sneaky secret. Back in 2001, at the end of 2001, after the anthrax letters had all come out, the Dean of the Graduate School at Louisville at the time, Dr. Ron Atlas, was also president of the um, National, Bi uh, National Microbiology Association. And he was giving his swan song speech 
in Washington, D.C., and he invited me and my patients to come with. And so what we did, and there were about 6,000 people in the audience that day. And by the way, we were all wondering, is the guy here? Is the guy who created that anthrax at the conference? Because we didn't know who it was. We're still not sure 100%. We have a good reason to think what we think, but... So we did a speech, Ron did a speech, talking about the things that he had done and his recent work using simulated patients and talking about bioterrorism and the importance of that training. Um, then he asked the question, if someone who looked like this were sitting next to you in this conference, what would you do? What would you say to them? And he got the same kind of nervous giggles and laughter that we just had together, right? And then he said, okay, you can stand up. And I had six standardized patients in the audience, just randomly distributed. They had IDs, they were dressed professionally, and they all were simulating smallpox. It was a really interesting response we got to that. Uh, People were immediately excited, intrigued, frightened, and unsure of what they should do or what they should have done. Because after you've sat there for a couple hours, it, you've been exposed, right? Obviously a big concern. So these are just some of the adventures I've had working with simulated patients. We do much, much more than what I have shared with you today. And so I thought I would just take a second and throw up um, uh, a few of the clients that I have worked with. I think it's worthwhile to mention everything I've described to you today took place in a six-year period. So now, with just a few minutes to go, I'd like to open the floor and ask you, what can't we do using patients? Take your mind out of it having to be bioterrorism and focus instead on how do we grow this to specifically target adult learners in a healthcare environment who may not know how to recognize lice because they haven't had that training yet, may not know how to recognize chicken pox, may not know the signs of child abuse, right? The bruises on the ankle, ears, these kinds of things. We're, how do we take what we do to the next level to benefit our public? Not just here in the States, because the world is flat, right? What happens here happens everywhere in the world. How do we address that? Oop, wrong way. Nope, that was the right way. There you go. Thank you. Oh, good. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. We do site cases with the College of Medicine all the time. All the time. Very powerful because students and learners don't expect that level of reality. And I just so happen to have written my master's thesis on schizophrenia and auditory hallucinations. So I am eyeball deep in the mental health stuff too. I love that. So I think that's a powerful direction for us to take it. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. How do we talk to them? And how do we create an environment where they feel safe asking us questions and telling us the things they're struggling with? What else might we do for them? I think it's awareness about the system. How do they 
I could get the child with autism through an airport. How do you, how are they, if they have to go to the point? Right. You're absolutely right. I think that's a brilliant idea. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Yes. So while you're on your site, as you work with your soul learners, you find some positive things that you can do in the That's a really interesting question. So what I've observed is there's very little difference because once you get them in the room with the patient or out on the field in Dallas with a patient, they forget this is fake. Now, I do this every, all day, every day in a little clinic up on South Limestone, right, where there are two cameras, microphones in the room. Students forget about that. And I'm talking medical students who are nervous about everything. <laughs> and never in my, I'm in my 25th year now of doing this, never has a medical student said to me, I couldn't focus because of the cameras. They forget like this if the simulation is realistic enough. And by the way, every one of the simulations you saw today was vetted by the CDC and by a personal friend at Louisville who was a retiring physician who had actually worked with smallpox patients. Those are great questions. Other questions? Oh, I'm missing them. Oh, yes. That's a great question. Here's how I would answer. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, so we, we attacked this question with Custom and Border Protection because everyone in 2006 was scared about avian influenza. Do you remember? We were worried about the coming pandemic. Little did we know. But so I spent the summer of 2006 down at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. I have stories, y'all. But what we learned was you can take the most simple list of items or symptoms. So all it has to do, all you have to do is trigger a red flag in that person's, in the first responder, in the healthcare provider, in the public health worker. All you have to do is trigger a red flag. And those things have so many things in common. As soon as they spot one of these, they should go into the mode of, okay, so I'm dealing with an individual who has these issues and I need to accommodate for those. Think about how powerful that would be for a police officer. So we did this with Custom Border Protection and I developed a list of seven items for taking a medical history because Custom and Border Protection is the front of the line against avian influenza coming across the border right? People trying to smuggle birds across the border. You would not believe the horrors. But um, so they didn't even know what personal protection equipment to wear. So guess who wrote the, um, the uh, policy, the national policy for PPE for Custom and Border Protection? My team and I did. And we are the ones who put it on the books. The next day it went to the Hill and it passed. Because they didn't know, will a surgical mask protect us from avian influenza? And we had to make the argument, no, you need an N95 and eye gear to protect you from this, plus gloves. And here's another thing to think about. We still can't force an American citizen to put a mask on if they don't want to. 
So if Deanna wants to get on the plane, you can't make her put a mask on to protect other passengers because she's a U.S. citizen. There's so much work in policy, training, assessment to be done in all of these areas. So much work to be done. And I'm super eager to do it with you. <laughs> if anybody would be interested in coming and touring our clinic, meeting some patients or talking further, I, um, I, I put my number and email up for you. Please feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you.